Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Grace, Peace, and Balance radio show by Gabi Abdel Gadir. And this is episode 108. And today I have an incredible human uh, for you. You're going to love her. You're going to love her story. And she has a new book coming up. And uh, I will be sharing her bio uh, on Podbean and on YouTube. Get in touch with her. She can be of great help. Her name is Marilyn Morales. Marilyn Morales is a registered nurse with over 30 years of experience in the healthcare field. Originally from Brooklyn, New York, Marilyn has been calling New Jersey home since 2004. She, her nursing career began at the age of 17, oh wow, when she graduated from Clara Barton High School with her LPN. Marilyn is a graduate of Eastern University and is board certified in holistic nursing. In addition to her nursing credentials, she is also a Reiki master. On September 11, 2001, Marilyn was one of hundreds of New York public health nurses who experienced the tragic events that unfolded that day. That was the start of her journey into the world of PTSD and its physical manifestations. A series of events, including the diagnosis of and loss of her youngest daughter to a rare leukemia followed. To heal herself from the grief and traumas, Marilyn went on a path of self-healing and discovery. Her passion is education, teaching others how to heal and move forward from the emotional traumas of grief and PTSD. Marilyn is also strives to carry on Isabella, that's the name of her daughter who passed legacy by shedding light on the need for diversity in the national bone marrow registry. Oh, wow. That doesn't even give you any credit, honestly. Yeah, welcome, <laughs> welcome to my podcast. Marilyn. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, uh, it, it was uh, long overdue. Absolutely, absolutely. We, we've been talking for a while and I, and I count you as one of my dearest friends. I know, me too. Like, remember the first day we talked, we talked over an hour. It was our very first conversation first that was supposed mm -hmm. to be like a five minute. It ended up being over an hour. That's right. Listen, I, I always say that, that like spirits always find each other, right? I so know, absolutely, absolutely. So glad that you are in, we're in the same network and we're always in touch. We're always supporting one another. So Tell our listeners about yourself. So um, just like you mentioned, I've been a nurse for over 30 years. I started my nursing career at the age of 17. I went to Clara Barton High School in New York, one of, I think, just two schools that offered that program. Uh, so I truly dedicated myself to medicine my entire life. Mm -hmm. um, Consequently, I was a public health nurse in the Lower East Side of Manhattan on that day of September 11th, just like a lot of Americans, you know, I went off that day to work thinking it was going to be just a normal day. Um, yeah, I think a lot of us looked at that blue sky in New York City and was an unusually um, warm day. It was like a summer day. It was gorgeous out that day. I remember admiring the sky as I was crossing the bridge from Brooklyn into Manhattan on the Williamsburg Bridge. I remember looking at it oh um, and thinking God. what a great day it was. Mm -hmm. um, and just a few hours later, we all know what happened, right? The, the yeah. New York City skyline was changed forever. It is. And, um, and it's uh, the whole planet too, Marilyn. Like I remember I was working... Somebody said, oh, my God, put the TV on. We have TVs on boardrooms. Like, so we, we all yeah. run to a large boardroom and we were watching these planes just driving through the build. Oh, my God. Yeah. OK. And yeah. So, you know, and I talk about this all the time. It's one thing watching it on television. And I've watched it on television too many times after that happened because it was constantly on the news. Yeah. Until one day I said, I can't do this anymore. I cannot continue to watch this. Um, so the school that I was at was just a few miles from the trade center, clear view of it. Many of the, uh, I was working in a school, in, a, in an elementary school at the time. Um, so many of the students, family members actually worked in the trade center. It was right there. You know, we were in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, so when that actually happened, um, I was able to see it. I was on the ground and see and felt 
Oh my goodness. Initially I was in a school. So I was talking to the students that were arriving for school, um, talking to their parents. I was a nurse in the school. So I was gathering medication from them and just talking to them. Um, when all of a sudden a mom walked in with her son and they were visibly shaken. Now I had felt the impact when the first airplane hit, I felt the whole building shake. But when you're from New York City, you know that sometimes these things happen. It could be a truck that backfires or, yeah. or something like that. Yeah. That's not unusual to us. So I initially thought it was something like that and thinking in my head, like, who the heck is, is messing around this time in the morning, you know? Yeah. Like, what was that? But not thinking it was anything serious. And the woman came in and I was like, what's going on? And she told me a plane just hit the trade center. Like, we literally watched it as it flew and hit the tower as they were entering the school. And her son, who was a young child at that time, he was maybe in second grade. Oh. Um, it, was, it was his birthday. I remember that very clearly. It was his birthday. So he was happy getting to school. He was going to celebrate with his friends. And he sees this. And he was tra he traumatized forever. I know. Forever. He was crying. She was crying. And I was like, oh, my God. And at that point, we thought it was just a horrible accident. You know? Um, so everybody's talking about this and just, as you know, just, you know, minutes later, the second one hits. Um, so it's pure mayhem in New York city on the street level. I go out at some point because I had gotten a phone call from a coworker telling me, um, they're jumping. And I, I was know, like, I what do you mean? Oh she was watching it from her school because there's many schools in the same area. So she's watching this from hers. She's looking at this and she doesn't even know. I think she was like, she was totally in shock. And so she called just to tell us this. And I'm like, what is she talking about? So my coworker and I said, let's go outside. Let's see what's going on. We're busy in here, but let's take a minute. Let's go outside and see what's happening. And as we go outside, that's exactly what we see. We see this tragedy unfolding in front of our eyes which is what I say, there are things that you see that you can never unsee. Yeah, absolutely. You cannot. So this is something that I was like, I cannot, I cannot. I had to go back inside because what I was witnessing was so devastating it is. that I could not understand or assimilate it. I know, I you're watching shock. it in life. We're watching it on TV, people jumping from God knows what floor. Right. All the way to the ground, running away from yeah. whatever. They were so, so imagine, imagine to be in that state where yeah. you're actually losing your life is better than what you're experiencing. Yeah. Oh my God. And then to see it happen in front of you. Yeah. You know, and as a nurse, I've seen, I've been a witness to people passing. You know, that mm -hmm. that wasn't unusual to me. I've seen it. I've been there mm -hmm. when people are passing from this uh, life to the next. So that wasn't, but the way that it was happening, I know. you know, that's a whole different thing. And, and I remember I was outside and there were people that, you know, ran up to me and grabbed onto me. I was wearing a stethoscope. So I was easily identified as a medical a professional. Yeah. yeah. A nurse. So they grabbed onto me, um, trying to figure out they were just being told to run from the towers, mm -hmm. just run. That's the only instruction they were given. And they had no idea where they were running to. Yeah. Uh, so after that, I suffered from the constant real, the constant pictures in my head, I not know. knowing really, you know, you hear about PTSD and you think about war veterans, right? Yeah. You think about people that were in the war and what they experienced. And we really don't know unless you're part of that, unless you're part of that war, you don't know what they've seen and how that affects you yeah. at all. Absolutely. If you're not in the military, but this time the war was brought home it was brought to us yeah to civilians that have absolutely no experience in this you know and so ptsd is real you know and, and i can't say that enough that it is an event it's a trauma in your life that you experience that is so severe that then you have a physical manifestation of it so you become sick you become physically ill yes so what and happened to you after I think it, I became, I became very sick. I became a migraines, insomnia, not being able to eat. Um, and, and, and I, and I used to never tell people how sick I was, but I I'm starting to talk about it and you become paranoid. Yes. Right? Yes. 
the paranoia is what started where uh, a, a friend of mine said, you're not well, you need help. You know, because she could see that I was like, oh my, you know, thinking how many people were involved, how many people knew, you know, we were put in danger. All those kind of things are things I'm sure that veterans of war go through as well. Yes. When you start to question reality. Yeah. Because the shock is so much that you don't know what's real and what's not real. Yes. And that's where I was. Mm -hmm. And I didn't feel safe in my own home. I didn't feel safe raising my children there. And New York was my, is my home. I still call it my home. Yeah. It was where I was born. It was where I, I didn't know anything else. So having to leave and making the decision that for my mental health and for my family's mental health, I needed to get out of there because I couldn't function. I couldn't mm -hmm. get past it. You know, no matter the things that I tried and I was trying different things, um, because I did, I don't think I understood how sick I really was. You know, I needed to get distance. I didn't deal with it. I put it back in my mind and said, okay, I got to move forward from this. And I just got to deal with my day and I have my kids to raise and started focusing on things like that. Um, but I couldn't see outside of myself. I knew I was sick. I knew that my migraines, I knew that physically I was not feeling well. It was the stress that was taking a toll on me. So I knew I needed to get away. So I finally get away. And I realized, you know, every time September 11th came around, you know, I was not well. Yeah. It was a trigger, right? So I had mm -hmm. all these triggers that I knew were related to that. But it wasn't until seven years later that I had my daughter, Isabella. Mm -hmm. um, and she was diagnosed at the age of seven months old with right. leukemia. And then I find out that it's a rare leukemia. A leukemia that it's called JMML, juvenile myelomonocytic leukemia. Mm -hmm. It is a cancer of children at the time under three years old. So a cancer of babies, I call it. Okay. Um, and the only treatment was a bone marrow transplant. And as a Hispanic, I was told, um, because initially we, they, we, were, we tested my children because they were going to be the best match for her because they were her siblings. So mm -hmm. your best match is somebody related to you, right? Our brother and yeah. her sister, they were tested and they were not matches for her. They were each yeah. a half a match. My husband and I obviously were going to be half matches for her as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we were told we have to find somebody in the registry, in the National Bone Marrow Registry. And as a Hispanic, we were going to have some trouble finding that because uh, there was not a lot of presence, Latino and mixed ethnicity individuals on that registry. So we were encouraged and told, we're going to work with you um, by um, be, the, uh, be the Match, which is the organization that helps you find matches, mm -hmm. you know, we, that we had to find um, a donor for her. So we had, to, we had to start having drives and have people join um, to see if we could find a match for her. Yeah. Um, fortunately, she did find her match. Okay. There was a person out there that matched her. Um, mm -hmm. But what I did find through that struggle um, was at the time I had kept, because I am a nurse, I kept lab results of myself, my husband, and my other two children. Um, and at the time, you could enter that information that they use in order to match you with somebody. It's called an HLA typing. It's a protein that's on our cells. And that's okay. what they use to match you, right? Okay. I, was, I had that information. So I entered it into the computer to see if we had matches. Mm -hmm. Isabella had matches. My husband had matches. I didn't, and neither did my children. Oh, wow. and, when I, and when I saw that, I literally, I felt like my heart stopped. I was like, oh my God, the only one of my children that ever stood a chance was Isabella. Had it been myself, had it been my other two children, there was nobody out there for us. Oh, wow. And I told my husband, you know, no matter what happens, we have to make sure that we continue to raise awareness, that we continue to have drives because, you know, God blessed us with having a match for Isabella, but there are so many children out there that don't, mm -hmm. you know, so many people that don't, and we have to continue to do that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the question of what happened to me after that, when I was going through that and after losing her, unfortunately, she passed six months after her transplant um, with complications, other complications that she had. It's nothing um, to do with the leukemia. 
No, actually, they it, it's a complication. She caught a virus, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. She was sick. She had an upper respiratory infection. She also had an infection in her leg that was starting, like a little bit of a skin infection. And in a regular child, that would be antibiotics, a little bit of monitoring, you're sent off home, no problem. Yeah. But in a child that has a compromised immune system, yeah. Oh. It totally, it totally uh, wrecked havoc on her body. Oh. Totally. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, she couldn't fight anymore. It just took her body over. So it's a complication of the leukemia because yeah. she didn't have an immune system like everybody else. Yes. You know? Yeah. But you know, she was doing well up until that point. Um, but after losing her, I realized I was having the same symptoms that I had the first time around with 9-11. 9-11. Because it was another trauma. Yes. It, it was a huge loss. So again, not being able to sleep, constant headaches, not being able to eat, constant pictures in my mind of that last hospitalization of every single day. It would go like every day from the time that we went in because she was there for an entire week before she passed. Mm -hmm. So she went from just being a little bit sick to getting sicker and sicker every day until she had to be put on life support. And then having to deal with taking her off life support when I realized um, that there was nothing more that we could do. Uh, but seeing those pictures in my mind, it was like every day, every day, over and over. It was the same thing that happened to me after 9-11. The yeah. pictures in my mind of what I was seeing um, that I realized, you know what, this grief is just like this, this PTSD is happening again. And I have to do something to get, make myself better. I have to get better. Did you, you know, try they, to see a psychiatrist or like a psychologist? Did you? I did not. I was encouraged to do that, to join a support group for parents who had lost children. Okay, that's good. I was encouraged by my doctor to start medication. You know, I accepted the script. I even filled the script, you know, but I kept it on a shelf. I didn't take it. What prescription um, was it? It was for an antidepressant. Okay. Yeah. Good for you for not taking it. That's horrible. Anyway. Yeah. Sometimes it's necessary. And I will tell you, sometimes that you have to have it in order to get you through the hump. I'm not totally against medication. Medication has its place, right? It helps us to start the healing. And some people, you have to do it yeah. because they then it will take the next step. You could be so um, into that depression, so mentally uh, depressed that you can't see outside of that. And you need a little bit of help in order to get to a point where then you accept the help, where then you can continue therapy, treatment, whatever it is, mm -hmm. right? Okay. For me, I felt it was not, going to help me. I didn't want to go that route. So I started to try to figure out things and I didn't want to go into group therapy because I felt that nobody could understand how I felt in my mind, in my perspective, I felt nobody has gone through what I just went through. Nobody's going to understand me. So how are they going to help me? That's how my mindset was at the time. But I said, I have to find ways to, to get myself out of this right? For my family's sake, for my sake and for their sake. Mm -hmm. And that's what started me on the road to holistic medicine, which is body, mind, and spirit, mm -hmm. which is, um, as I was reading, I did a lot of reading books was my number one thing that got me out of that. I did a lot of reading, a lot of reading people who were, who had the same experience or similar experience to me. Mm -hmm. Right. So then I would read how they got themselves out of it, whether it was Aromatherapy was one of the biggest things that helped me. There's some essential oils that help to calm you, that you associate with positive things in your life. And that helps you get your mind into a different state. It that does. helped me. It does. I, it live, me. I live by essential oils. Mm -hmm. But it was one of the things that I tried, right? Okay. And I saw that it worked. Yeah. So then I would experiment with different things. I would experiment. And I, and I started using essential oils before this. So let me backtrack a little bit. When my daughter was diagnosed with cancer, right? I was an older mom when I had her. So they call you advanced maternal age, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to go see counselors 
uh, genetic counselors and you go through all this extra stuff because you're an older mom. I was 38 years old, okay? Yeah. But I was considered an older mom. So when I was pregnant with Isabella, I had gone to these counselors and they told me that the only thing that my husband and I triggered for was cancer. The only thing. Oh, and wow. I said, what am I supposed to do with that information? Right? I'm not terminating my pregnancy based on that. Yeah. I said, I have two other children with the same exact gene, same mom, same dad. Right. And they're fine. So I said, thank you for that information. But you know, I'm going to go. <laughs> yeah. There's nothing I'm going to do with that information. And I really didn't ask any more questions. And we left. Mm -hmm. And here we go. The child that I was carrying would eventually have cancer, you know? So now I'm fast forwarding to, I'm pregnant now with my fourth child, Lorenzo. Um, so this time, again, now I'm 42. They tell, I go back to the same counselor, right? And same thing, I'm treating for cancer. And I said, you know what? I don't know if you guys remember me. I was here a couple of years ago when I was pregnant with my daughter and I didn't listen then, but I'm listening now what am I supposed to do different based on that information? Mm -hmm. And they told me, well, you have to live your life differently. You have to do screenings, you know, earlier. You have to make sure that your children live a healthy lifestyle and that you're teaching them healthy lifestyles from now. And another thing is decreased amount of chemicals that you use in your home because chemicals trigger cancer. Some yeah. chemicals are cancer causing. I read. So eliminate that from your home. I learned that then. So I was using, you know, essential oils at that time. That's when I was introduced to essential oils. And I was like, you know what? Let me research natural ways to clean my home. You know, and when I was, when I had her, I was doing that because she had cancer. So I started using essential oils then for that reason. Mm -hmm. So then after I lost her, I started using essential oils for a different reason in order to help my mood and balance and things like that. Yeah. Um, so reading that. Um, meditation, yeah. you know, one of the hardest things I had to learn was meditation. Um, but it helps to quiet your mind. It, it helps to stop the pictures. It so does. when the pictures are coming in your yeah. mind, that's a tool that you use to stop, acknowledge that those thoughts are coming yeah. and tell them, okay, you're not serving. You're not serving me. So let me focus on something else to stop the constant reels. And that yeah. worked. Yeah. And that worked. You know, I started doing things like Reiki and I'm now I'm a Reiki master. Reiki helped me so much that um, it relaxed me and put me in a different state that I could feel myself coming from a level 10 where I was a, a lot of a lot of the time. Yeah. At least to a level five. So it was half of what I was. And for those people that don't know what Reiki is, Reiki is one of those things that are energy medicine. The person that is actually doing Reiki, they don't touch you. They're in your energy field, right? And I, I liken it to when your car dies because your battery dies in your car, right? What do you need to restart that car battery? You need jumper cables, right? You connect from one energy source to another. You put those jumper cables on and boom, your car turns on magically, right? Yeah. Same thing with Reiki. It's that the practitioner is like those jumper cables. They're just a conduit. They're just the way that the energy, life force energy moves from the universe around us through that practitioner into you, who is that dead car battery in order to restart your energy centers exactly. so that your body can do the work. The yeah. practitioner is not doing the work. You are. Okay. So can I share a, a little story about Reiki, my experience with Reiki? So Please I had do. fallen and, uh, broken my ankle right my ankle was like completely twisted this way anyway yeah I was like carried uh, in an ambulance and I was like I couldn't walk like for three and a half months I was off work I couldn't I couldn't work so I had a computer chair you know with yeah. the one foot I push it to go wherever I want other anyway so I was in so much pain because the bone was cracked so the doctors gave me Tylenol 4, which is the strongest anti-pain medication, mm -hmm. but it has its side effects as well. So three days later, my best friend, who is also a Reiki master and a feng shui practitioner, she 
called me just to say hi. Like we talked three, four times a week, right? She goes, and then I started crying, right? I said, I'm not working. This happened to me. I fell and this and that. And she goes to me, oh my God, why didn't you tell me? So what are you doing? I told her I'm taking these Tylenols and uh, this and people have been like my husband's. Right? I don't have family in Canada, but my husband's relatives, some of them are really nice. So they come, they take turns every morning. They come and uh, Mikey at the time was 12. So he could take care of himself my son, but they would come and uh, provide me breakfast and then they put in my coffee. I am a coffee addict, my coffee. And then they put a video that I, ha- I wanna watch, which was all the secrets and all the Don, uh, Dr. Wayne Dyers. That's all I had it all. I said, uh, there is something, I'm getting a message here. And right. then, so I, I asked them to put this video DVD for me. And then they put my medication, my water and everything beside my, I was in the sofa, right? And um, they would go. So I, she goes to me, oh my God. Okay, can you tell me when the person who's going to come and feed you and all that, when the person leaves, call me, I'll come. So I called her when, when that lady left she she just came in she goes to me okay oh my god she was shocked like when she heard the whole story of what happened to me she was shocked she goes to me okay lie down close your eyes she started working from here Mm -hmm. she didn't touch me just her hands went through me slowly this is for you Taya Cosma just so you know I'm sure she's (laughs) gonna watch this so that's for her so she was doing that so when she got to my knee I could feel like apparently because the way I felt it was on the, my right side. Yes, my ankle was twisted, but my whole, my hip and my knee were hurt too. But the doctors at the hospital, they only focused on what was broken, like the, 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 right, the bone. Yeah. I felt like somebody just poured boiling oil on my knee. That's how hurtful it was when she was working. She goes, she didn't talk. She just kept on working on it more and longer. And then when she got to the actual ankle, oh my God, I wanted to die. I became a believer of Reiki. And you know what? That night, I didn't have to take Tylenol. I slept through the night without pain. Amen. That's right. So I admire you for doing that. It works. And, and I was, you know, I was, I was the patient first and I saw how it worked on me mm-hmm. um, on many levels, my headaches, the constant headaches that I couldn't get rid of, yeah. you know, so that helped a lot with my headaches, just an overall sense of relaxation. I always say at the very minimum, you're going to be relaxed. Yes. And who doesn't need relaxation? Exactly. You know, I need it right now as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few minutes of relaxation yeah. transforms you. A little bit of rest transforms you. So at the very minimum, you have that. But yeah, you feel the heat. I felt the heat moving through um, and healing, especially right here, my heart. The heart chakra, yeah. The heart chakra, which yeah. is, and my, and my um, you know, um, that whole area was just um, in flames, I feel, like hot. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, I hold all my stress that's in my true. in my stomach your in my power abdomen center, in this, yeah 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 your, your power, power center, center that's yeah. where I hold it and I was holding on to a lot I was holding I on to a lot and in order to cope I wasn't letting it out so you hold it in and you hold it in and you hold it in until your body starts to explode on its own right it starts to break down on its own because yeah. you're not letting it out yeah so it helped me tremendously I learned about it in um when I was in school in college getting my BSN mm-hmm. um this is after after Isabella, uh, one of my co- the students that were in there with me, she was a Reiki practitioner, a nurse. Mm-hmm. And I will tell you that Reiki is used in hospitals all over. Oh, really? Yes, it is. It I'm... absolutely is. Oh, wow. Yeah, there are nurses trained in Reiki everywhere. They use it um, after someone has surgery to decrease the amount of pain medication, just like you, to mm-hmm. decrease the amount of pain medication that they're using, you know, um, so that they're not on narcotics when they leave. <laughs> And it, and it, and it enhances the healing. So it makes the healing happen faster. And like I say, it's, it's the person, your body is doing the work. Yeah. You're receiving the energy. Your body is using the energy. Your only job is to let it happen. (laughs) You have to be open-minded. A lot of people are not open-minded to this kind of treatment. You know, the energy treatment, they don't believe in it. 
they just right. believe in like going to the hospital running and taking all these medications they don't believe it you have to be open-minded because it works it does work yeah it does work you gotta remember that the i always say that illness begins in the mind right yes. it starts here first but guess where healing begins too illness begins in the mind healing begins in the mind absolutely so both of those, you have to be open, open your mind to it. The same way you opened your mind and you allowed all those negative thoughts to come to you, all that negativity and, and thinking that you can't get better and that life isn't going to get better for you. Yes. The way to turn on the healing is to tell your mind, nope, that's a lie. Things are going to get better. I am going to get better. Yes. Keep it's using just your affirmations. Yeah. Affirmations and changing your perspective. Yeah changing the perspective. You could look at the same situation in two different ways. Yeah. You have the ability to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And then a question I had for you, after the 9-11, yeah. whatever happened, were you scared to get into a plane? I, I was like, I, did, I wasn't even in New York, like I'm in Canada, but I was horrified to be in a plane for after many- that, I don't know why, yeah. Well, for many, obviously. many years. I don't think I, I got into a plane again. Maybe 2011. So 10 years. Wow. I believe you. Yeah. My best I, friend, yeah. one of my best friends got married a couple months in. I couldn't do it. I missed her wedding. I missed the birth of her daughter. Oh. I missed, I can't tell you how many things I missed because of fear yes same here i couldn't see an airplane every in the, initially when an airplane would fly over i would cringe my body would automatically go into this position it's like i kept waiting for impact i kept thinking it was going to happen again mm-hmm. i know especially I like uh, yeah and you know i would follow every airplane that i saw in the sky i would follow to see where it was going you know, know, because there was so many, I'm telling you, it's, that's the paranoia. That's the paranoid exactly. part of it. That when you get so sick, you can't, you don't know what's real and what's not real. Yeah. You know, nothing was going to happen. I know that. And but then it, any, any loud sound also, when you hear sound. that would also, I, I get that as well. So anything yeah. loud would scare me. Um, yeah. And I didn't travel i didn't get on a plane up until when was it gabby 2012 2011 yeah 2011 was the first time also i got in a plane with you and son. me yeah you and me oh my <laughs> goodness yeah. yeah yeah i'm telling you i couldn't i couldn't do it and then i did it and you're still and you're <laughs> i know <laughs> you're praying the entire time yeah i recently just flew now to to visit my brother in texas and i was still like oh my god <laughs> sweating I was so anxious about flying still and I was like you know what you know what's different about me today is that I now have tools as we call tools in the toolbox so that when that happens I can bring myself down yeah healing is ongoing I'm always going to have these triggers they're always going to be and I don't know if one day is going to be worse than another one day I can hear the noise and it's not going to bother me but another day I hear the noise and it's going to bring me right back yeah. You just don't know when it's going to happen. Absolutely. But when it happens, I now have tools to bring tools. myself down. Yeah. Right. I carry my essential oils around because that is really calming to me. There Which ones do you are, use to calm well, you down? I will tell you a frankincense is a big one. Yeah. Frankincense, Same lavender. Here. Lavender is my favorite. And I'll mix lavender and peppermint together because okay. um, it's like a spa. Yeah. <laughs> so it reminds me of good things. Those are the things you have to think about scents that remind you of good things. Yeah. You know, I love citrus scents because they remind me of, of fruit and clean and, and being outdoors, you know, those I use things. orange citrus in orange. my car. I have a car diffuser. Eh? I use the orange, the citrus yes. orange. I diffuse that in my car. Like when yes. I go, so either that or lemon, I use that all the time, but lemon. the spiritual ones like sage, if I had a yes. bad day or if my son had a bad day, I would sage the place and then followed by frankincense. 
Yeah, right? Frankincense yeah, is one of my favorites, absolute yeah, favorites. Is. Yeah, but that's what Jesus and everybody were using, right? Like that, it's it's biblical. Like if you go to all the churches, especially the Orthodox churches, I, yes, they use like you would come out of church like smelling frankincense because they actually burn it, right? We do, they I burn do that it right well. on, on yeah. a little carbon. I do that too. They have yes. the frankincense resin, the little resin yes, that you I, put on top of it. Yeah, yeah, and you know, but church was good to us. We found comfort in our church. And okay. that's why when we smell that, it brings us back to Jesus and feeling like we're not alone, which is what we get from that. I'm not alone. I'm feeling connected, you know, to the higher being when okay. I smell that. That's what aromatherapy is about. Yeah. It's being able to trigger positive thoughts and memories. Uh, yes. Now, if you have a if you were sick one day from orange, you're eating too many oranges, you know. <laughs> That same smell is not going to be good to you. It's not going to trigger that positive feeling. Yeah. So there are so many different things that you can try and just pick things that you know you associate with yeah. happy times, with good things. Yeah. And that's, that's going to change. It changes your mood. It's something that you can use. It's easy, right? It's mm -hmm. portable. Just like you said, it, you exactly. use it in your car. Yeah. So I, I there's diffuse, little diffusers. Yeah. There's I have one diffusers. in my bedroom and I have one in my car. Yeah. My son is like, it's too much, mom, the whole night. Like, it's too much. <laughs> but like, so for him, like an hour and then you take it out. But I, I fill it up. I put my oils according to what my day was like. And it has to yeah. be something spiritual. And then it works all night. Like it, it turns off like from young living after four hours by itself. So uh, yeah, the and there's diffusers so. that can do every 15 minutes, like it'll puff something out every few minutes, yeah, so that it's intermittent. Yeah, and you know, if you don't have a diffuser, it doesn't mean you can't have aromatherapy, right? You have exactly. a cotton ball, yeah, that you can put on it, you put it in the vents of your house, yeah, and you got aromatherapy, <laughs> exactly, exactly. All the other incense, the sticks, too, they work, you know, everything, everything works. It's just yeah. finding what works for you and what can bring you down. You're level 10. What can bring you down to a five? What can bring you down to a two? Exactly. I don't think I could ever get to zero, you know? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, said, know. I, I don't know live us. at zero ever, yeah. right? I don't yeah. think I was born at a zero. So I know. I, if I can bring myself down to a two, then I'm really, really good. That's sleep. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. Let's talk about your upcoming book. I'm so excited. Yes. So the book is titled When the Answer is No, Finding Purpose Through Pain. And it talks about when you pray and hope for positive outcomes in situations that happen in your life. Um, and let me tell you, I did a lot of praying, right? I did a lot of praying through both of those um, episodes in my life. Um, but I kept feeling like the universe is telling me, no, not you. You can't have this good thing. You know, no, your daughter cannot be saved. And I felt like the profession that I had dedicated my life to and, and the God that I had dedicated my life to my whole life had let me down, had said no. But sometimes the answer is no, right? Yeah. But because the purpose is greater than we can ever imagine. So what did I do with that? What did I do with the uh, symptoms that I suffered from, from the pain of 9-11 is I'm able to talk about it. I'm able to show people that this is normal that don't feel that you're alone and that you're not normal and that you can't speak up about it. I'm a medical professional, right? I'm a woman, I'm a mom, I'm a lot of things just like you. And if it happened to me, it can happen to you too. Yeah. It just doesn't happen to war vets. It happens to us. Let's talk about it. Let's not be afraid to talk about it. Yeah. You know, cause that's the first step in healing is acceptance of what has happened to you. Mm -hmm. Right. And that you're able to move forward. So I'm just looking to give a hand and bring those people through through my story. So I'm trying to share my story of not only that that has happened to me, but the healing that happened after that. The yeah. acknowledgement that I had of what happened to me and that I was sick and that I needed to make myself better. And the, yeah. some of the tools that I used to do that. I share the story of my daughter uh, because this is twofold, right? What did I learn from her? Right. And, and how do I bring my daughter's legacy forward? Every single one of us, when we leave this earth, we want to leave a legacy behind. Yes. We want to be remembered. Yeah. And as her mother, I want to make sure that she's remembered and that yeah. her legacy lives on. And one of the important things, like I shared that I learned through her illness was that there is not a presence as there should be uh, for those of us of 
uh, Latino ancestry, of uh, African American ancestry, of mixed ethnicities. If I can share some statistics, if you're white, you have a 79% chance of finding a match in that registry. Yep. If you're Latino, you've got a 48% chance. Look how that drops, right? If you're black, 28% chance. Oh Look goodness. at that drop. We got to do better. Yeah, we got to do better. And when I look at that now, and this is a big blessing to me, my oldest daughter, Gabrielle, Gabby, just like yeah. you with one B. Yeah, <laughs> Gabby with one B. Yeah, Gabby with one B. She now works for Be The Match. She now works for the, for the institution that helped her family. She was nine years old when this happened, right? Oh. And she, after that, always felt that she needed to do something. So my daughter found purpose in her pain as well. And now I'm so proud that she is now working for them. And, you know, she's the one that shared these statistics with me. She is the one now finding that and saying, mom, I cannot believe this. This is how many years later that this happened to Isabella and to our family. And it's no better. You know, so we said we so got to do something. Yeah. So I'm bringing attention. I felt like I needed to step it up this year and say, what can I do to bring attention? What can I do to educate people on the need? Um, to join the registry. Yes. So in my book, there is going to be a page dedicated where you can go directly. There's a link there that you can scan or you can text the code and it will take you right to the registry so that you can join oh, if you wow. meet the criteria. That's incredible, Marilyn. So, so you That's can join incredible. the registry. So I said, if you're moved by Isabella's story, then join the registry. And if you cannot, if you don't meet the criteria, because you have to be between the ages of 18 and 40, if you're not between those ages, it doesn't mean that you can't help because I'm sure that you know somebody between those ages. Yes, absolutely. And you can share her story and share our story and encourage them to join the registry. Yes. So for every book that is sold, that is a life that can be saved yes. by joining the registry. Yes, that's beautiful. Beautiful. When is the book going to be out? January 7th, 2023. Yay, January 7th. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, January yeah. Can't wait. Can't wait. You're doing a great job. And, uh, you know, God bless you for what you do. And uh, you've gone through a lot. Like, and even me, like about the 9 11, just watching all these people jumping off. Uh, the windows or whatever it was I had nightmares about that for so long yes. and then I was afraid to get into a flight like I used to travel a lot in, you know in my younger days but I was right. scared to get into a plane up until 2011 and uh, then prayer like you said I got in and my son was with me at the time and I just prayed I said God please have us travel in safely if, if not for me just for my son that's how I did it like that's Absolutely. what I said in my prayer right like just for my son's sake we want to get wherever we're gonna go we just went to Europe and then the flight was to one city to London and the rest was all by bus and by boats by this so it was fine so the next flight was just to come back to Canada and the same prayer, but I am much better now, but still just looking at it, just see watching, watching it on TV. It gave me that anxiety. Same thing. Yeah, exactly. And how many people are not like you and I, Gabby? Exactly. Many, many, many. Oh, yeah. We're just, we're just willing to talk about it. Yeah. You know, cause a lot of people initially, I wasn't able to talk about it. Yeah. I wasn't willing to talk about it. Yeah. I wasn't well enough to do it. Yeah. But now that I've gotten to the other side, I'm just looking to give a hand to those and say, listen, no matter what the situation or circumstance, yeah. you can get through it. You can get onto the other side, yeah. but you got to take the first step. Yes, absolutely. And you're doing a great job. Oh my God. I could talk to you like Thank you. for hours. Thank you so <laughs> much. That was absolutely beautiful. And, uh, Let's just switch before we get to the last word. I want to ask you that I ask everybody in my uh, podcast, if you had to visit three countries before you die, what countries would they be? I don't know why I love asking this question, but I do. What's on my bucket list, I'll tell you, is Italy. Okay. <laughs> okay, one. Spain. Two. And um, Portugal. Why Portugal? And interesting. I did my ancestry DNA and found out that most of my DNA comes from Portugal. 
Are you serious right now? Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. my god do you want to know why 30 30 percent 30 point number one my mom's dna was more powerful than my dad's believe it or not no, I, I am 30.5 percent ethiopian jewish oh my that god. was the shock of the <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was and then my friend is like telling me we did it together and then she's telling me no wonder your mom was so tough uh because i i share my stories growing up how tough my mom was like a lot of things right and then she goes now i know where your mom why your mom was like that she was a jew <laughs> she was oh. just, i know she was jewish people are known like tough like they've struggled a lot right they've struggled a lot and uh, they have been mistreated a lot. And even the Ethiopian Jewish, like the, the, even by their own community, they are not treated nicely just because they're Jewish. They don't, they're not, they don't believe in what the other people believe. They're not Muslims, right, they're right. not considered Christians fully. So yeah, so they've been mistreated, but now then they decided, I think they, they need to make some like every, multi-millionaire is like a Jew. They work hard. They made themselves like, you know, get to where they should be. But that was the shock of the century. My dad didn't end up even being like fully Turkish, like he's supposed to be that we know about. Right. He has Persian in him. He has Greek in him. Unbelievable. I, I, I was just shocked. But the Listen, majority, we're all, yeah. We're the all, majority we are also people, mixed. We are also mixed. I know. I know my fourth one, I'm going to add a fourth one is Africa because that's what shows up in my DNA. Which one? It is Africa. East Africa? Which it's one? All the, Nigeria is the first. Nigeria, okay. It's Africa. the most prominent one is Nigeria. Yeah, so, I have that too in my blood. Like, yeah, that's one I of my, Nigeria my bigger too. ones. I have yeah, Egypt. I have a, yeah, I have Egypt. I have Nigeria, but the majority ended up being ethiopian jewish and uh oh my god i was just so worried no wonder we look so different like you know we don't i don't look like my mom i don't look like my dad mm. uh and uh my mom never looked like an ethiopian she never did she was way too white for an ethiopian she was way too she was different period right and right. Uh, the children where everybody used to be scared of her that's how powerful she was she just you just have to look at her and bend like, you know, wow. don't, you can't look at her. You can't stare at her. That's how powerful she was. And, uh, and then the children, when they see her coming, they go, oh, my God, go go inside. The Italian lady is coming. That's what they used to call her, right? The, the Italian the, the lady. Children, the Italian <laughs> lady is coming because she used to tell them, stop, go inside and things like that. And uh, uh, and uh, that's what now when I, we did this ancestry thing, it took me like a week for me to really absorb the list. We know who we are, but we don't. Honestly, we don't. We don't know our ancestry. We don't know our background. Right. And I believe that when we talk about resilience and you've gone through a lot of things in your life from oh, beginning yeah. to end, right? Yeah, Just did. like me, when, when they talk about, you know, resilience and being strong, and I think you're, you're strong because you don't have another choice, right? Yes. <laughs> But we come from DNA of women who have had to fight and struggle their whole lives. Our yeah. grandmothers, our great grandmothers, that you know. So yes. that comes down generation after generation, and I think you know it, it's getting passed on in your DNA that this is, you know, you have a situation and you deal with it. You deal with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're strong because you are. Yes, you have no option. Well, my mom did prepare me. Uh, I have to give her that credit. She always used to tell me life is never going to be always sugar and honey. Yeah. True story. And uh, she told me you have the only the strong ones surviving. So I want you to be strong. That's one of the things she always said. And the other thing is, oh, I want to do this. I want to do that. I used to be like that, right? She goes to me, whoa, 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 sit down. You need to take it one step at a time, because if you try to take four steps at a time, what happens? You fall down and break. So keep your goals, calm down with your goals, finish one thing and then go to the next and then to the next. You don't 
want to do everything at once because I had all these dreams in my younger days and all that stuff anyway but yeah so she uh she uh she was she was a tough woman so um, my mother too she was a very tough yeah. woman same thing I have to give her the reason why I am the way that I am and she yeah, helped me, me through every single part of all of that she was a big part of healing me okay. um you know and the stories of her childhood and it was not easy nothing yeah. was easy oh, you well, know so too, yeah yeah they didn't have easy lives. So they had to show us how to, how to navigate that, how to do better. Yeah. yeah. And they did their job. Yeah, they did. The, um, growing up, I wasn't very much fond because I got a lot of beating. You know, the beating that I got, Marilyn, growing up, not only from my mom, but from the nuns, the Italian nuns in my Catholic school, yeah. could have been enough for a couple of dozen people here right now. Yeah. So... I always had this hate towards those nuns and I had and my mom also because she was so nice to my brother who is six years older than me and I'm always left out right. I always felt left out right they play together they do things together I was always left out so and then the fact that I never did what I wanted piano is one of the things that my brother told her to stop me she did listen to him I was good at soccer when it became to travel, she wouldn't allow me to travel with the group. And, mm. then, and then basketball, the same thing. No, I'm, if I have a girl, I don't want her to be a tomboy. She would send me the whole freaking summer to etiquette classes, to cooking classes. To oh, sewing. my God. I hated that. But there are so many things that what she did that I started to appreciate when I became an uh, when I actually started an that yeah an adult not only an adult like when i started in the when i became in the job market mm -hmm. i started meeting all these different cultures all these nationalities all these people the things that happen between people every word that she used to say and i used to say in my mind this woman talks too much what's she talking about every single sentence she made me listen happened to me in life mm. You know what I mean? Don't yes. call. Yeah. So like, uh, so it was too late when I, I took care of her until the last day of her life. No doubt about that. But there are certain things I couldn't forget as a child. The punishments right. that I got, you know, and things like that. Some of them were really harsh. I don't even want to talk about them. I, they're not even in my Grace, Peace, Balance book because I don't mm. want my son to read that. The punishments were really harsh. But then the last time we were together, before she passed, she told me what my grandmother, how my grandmother used to punish her. And then it hit me, later on it hit me. No wonder my mom was so harsh because her mom, that's how she treated her. Right. So it didn't come out of nowhere, you know what I mean? Yeah, you only know what you know, right? Yeah, so that like is that's... that anyway, yeah. So, okay, so we said Italy, we go back to our conversation, Italy, Spain, and Portugal. That's how it started, the Portugal yeah. part. That's right, Portugal. <laughs> yeah, okay, so Portugal, you've got three. So if there is one dream that you would like to fulfill that you haven't even started yet, because I know that you have a dream and you're fulfilling it right now. If right. there is one dream that you want to fulfill before you die. What that's a hard be? one. That's yeah, a hard it is. one. It is. That's a hard one because, you know, I don't, what I'm doing now was a dream that I always had. Yeah. And I felt that I was running out of time. No, you're not. I you're felt that. Yeah, but... I'm still young, but I yeah. said, it's, 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 I felt like, you know what? I should have started this a while back. I thought about, you know, writing the book and bringing attention and, and doing all these things a long time ago. And I just never did it. And I felt like, you know, it's now or never. I got yeah. to a point where I said it's now or never. So it's now, you know? <laughs> yeah, now, but it's not going to end up on one book only. You know that, right? It's not going to no, end up in no, one no, book absolutely. only. No, no, absolutely. This is yeah. the first book. And I say that all the time. This is the first book because I'm introducing you to what happened to me because of these two things. Yeah. But I know that there are so many things, especially with Isabella's journey, yeah. that there was evidence of a higher being throughout this whole thing that I have to tell that story. Yeah. You know, there's, there's yeah. so much more to that story. Yeah. I said that the details of that year that we spent at the hospital would fill up the pages of a book and it will. Oh my goodness. I believe you. Yeah. I was, I, a, I, 
and I say, I, you know, I'm an eyewitness to a lot of things that other people don't get to witness. You know, I had a front row seat to a show nobody wants to go to. Oh my God. And because I was, uh, because I'm a nurse, uh, I was at night up wake because I couldn't sleep. Uh, a lot of the nurses would come into my room to talk. So I was able to pretty much interview them, you know, about what was happening, you know, in the hospital with other children. I could not believe how many children are afflicted with cancer. And being a nurse, because I wasn't in pediatrics, I didn't know. I always thought of cancer as something you got because, you know, you didn't, you didn't eat right. You didn't, you smoked, you know, you didn't, you abused your body to help that happen to you. You know, something triggered it to happen. But children, babies, they don't do any of those things. Exactly. Exactly. They're not even stressed out. They don't know how to get stressed out. You know, they're babies. So how do babies end up like this? That was like mind blowing to me. And the amount of children. I was in Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Sometimes we would have to get admitted. If she got a fever, we would have to get admitted so that they could keep an eye on her, you know, while we were waiting to get the transplant. Um, and we would get admitted and there, there's no room to put us in. Are you serious? No oh my yes. goodness. They would have to take the play rooms and transform them into, into hospital rooms in order to, to accommodate the amount of children that were sick. Blows my mind every single time. And this is just one city we're talking about. Can you one, imagine? That's right. Can you imagine across right. the state, across the country, and across the planet? Oh, absolutely. My absolutely. Yeah. That's how I was like, I cannot believe this. But there's so many things that happened before I had her, while I was pregnant with her, that foreshadowed what was to come. But I didn't yeah. know it at the time. Yeah. You don't know what you don't know. Until yeah. afterwards, and you look back and you go, oh, my God, there were signs yes. that things were going to happen. You know, I don't know if you remember this phenomenon when 9-11 happened and this and this has been written about in newspapers and things like that. There were a large amount of people that were dreaming about the towers being hit or things happening right before it happened. A lot of people were having strange dreams. I yeah, I think I saw a woman, uh, I think I read about a woman, actually, she actually saw it in her dream happen. My mother saw it in her dreams happen. Are you serious right now? And so did I. But I was inside of the glass building. I didn't know it was the towers. I had a dream the same night my mother had a dream, right? Mm-hmm. And in her dream, she saw this people running that she goes, it looked like they were roaches in the street. How many people? were running she was like it was thousands in the street she had in her living room the brooklyn bridge and the twin towers and in her dream she is looking at this um glass um portrait that she had in her living room and she saw it disintegrate right before her eyes oh my god it just gave me goosebumps are you serious right now yeah I, I swear to you so as I tell her mom I had a weird dream she goes so did I what was yours and I she told me hers and I went oh my god I was in a glass building and planes were flying around the building and I was in this building and I there were friends of mine from high school in the building and I'm trying to figure out how to get away from all of this and it felt like we were under attack in the dream and I was like this is crazy that we both had this weird dream and this was months before it happened months before so we just think it's two crazy dreams right we don't think anything of it and lo and behold right before this happened I ran into girls from high school that were in my dream I ran into them they were also working as public health nurses and I didn't put them together until after they happened I'm like oh my god my dream her dream where she saw this whole thing just crumble into pieces in her dream right before her eyes. And she could see all these people, thousands of people. Did she remove that picture afterwards or not? It actually, when we moved from New York to New Jersey, it unfortunately broke in the move. Yeah. It was made out of glass. That would be negative energy to carry around. It actually broke itself before it it didn't even make it out out of Brooklyn. It never made it out of Brooklyn. Yeah, that's So, But we weren't the only two. What crazy is that afterwards, 
there were all these reports. And if you Google it, you'll find it. There were all these reports of the mass amount of people that were having these same dreams right before 9-11. Oh my God. Foreshadowing what was to come, right? Yeah. So similar thing happened to me before I had Isabella. Dreams that I was having before she was born. This one is news to me. I never knew that you had a dream in your mom. Oh my goodness. Yeah, we don't talk about that too much. <laughs> I know. Seriously, yeah. I know. Oh my goodness. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But there are things that foreshadow. Yeah. So, you yeah. know, there are things that you have to talk about later on. And it may seem crazy to people, but it isn't. And when you see how many people it happened to, you go, oh my God, you too? You know, it yeah. happened to a lot of people. Yeah. Oh my God. That is amazing. So stay tuned for book number two. For book number <laughs> two. Yeah, it's coming. I knew that. I knew that. It's not going to stop at one. Yeah, for sure. So what's your last word for the listeners or people watching? What's your last advice? My last thing that I do want to bring is please look into becoming a donor, a potential donor on the Be The Match Registry. Go to my page, izzyslegacy.com. It will tell you all about it. And there's actually a link so you can join the registry on my webpage. So, I, you know, we're making it real easy for you guys. Yeah. You know, this is something that you can save a life in life. You don't have to pass away to donate this organ. That w- it's, it's so, it saves so many lives. Yeah. And it's simple. So please just consider doing that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was an incredible story. And uh, I will be posting, like I mentioned, uh, her bio, her, all her social media links and when to find her book on Podbean and on YouTube. Uh, thank you for listening. Please listen, share, subscribe, like. And until the next episode, stay blessed. Thank you. Thank you.